This morning, our scripture reading told of Jesus' last meeting with his disciples in Matthew, the 28th chapter. You'll notice there in verse 16, it says that the 11 disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. It's rather remarkable that Jesus earlier, before his arrest, had told his apostles where he was going to meet them after this was all over. They should have known by that that he was coming back, that he was going to be resurrected. But some of them still doubted, and as he met with them, it mentions the fact that some still doubted. They hadn't been fully convinced. For it was after the resurrection of Jesus that he appeared to the apostles on several occasions under very controlled and, uh, conditions. But now he mentions an appointed time. What a wonderful thing it must have been for these followers of Jesus who had been with him for over three years had grown to love and respect him as master and Lord. For them to know that they were going to be able to see him again. They were probably overjoyed to travel to Galilee and there find him waiting for them. But this morning we want to talk about some other appointments that we can have with Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't come into the world to leave us. He came into the world to be with us, to help us, to save us from sin, and to give us hope and comfort. And in order to do that, Jesus left behind some things that are very important to us. Some ways that we can join with Him. Some ways that we can be a part of Him, even though He has returned to the Father. The first of these is an appointment at the cross. We know that it was at the cross where Jesus died, where He paid the price for sin and where He suffered the Roman crucifixion. But in John, the 12th chapter, in verse 32, Jesus had told his disciples, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. For centuries now, the cross has been a place that has drawn men to Jesus. The one thing that Jesus accomplished for the human race was to give himself a ransom for the loss of the world. And he did that at the cross. Sometimes we sing about the cross, at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. We sing about the power of the cross and the fact that the cross, though it was a sign of humiliation, becomes for us a reason for glory and hope. If you notice in the Colossian letter, which Paul penned to the church there, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, Paul had this to say, For it pleased the Father, he said, that in Christ should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. When we meet Jesus at the cross, we meet ourselves. We meet the condition of our souls, the fact that we are sinners. We have disobeyed the laws of God. And as a result, we're in need of a Savior. But no man was suitable. God then sent His only begotten Son, <clears throat> that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The cross draws the world. The cross is a testament to God's love. And so we come to the cross in gratitude, in love, in compassion. Realizing that our sins nailed Him there. And only through His blood can we have the remission of our sins. 
And as Paul says, through his blood, the blood of the cross, Christ made peace with all men. That is, he made peace between God and man. He removed the debt of sin that man and God could once again be united, be united in peace. The cross is a place where we can meet Christ. The cross is where every human being of accountability should meet with the Lord. And realizing that at the cross we recognize our sinful state and put our sins away. Paul describes this in Romans the 6th chapter. When he talks about putting to death the old man of sin and nailing him to the cross. In a sense, we die there as Jesus died. The great apostle Paul in Galatians 2 and verse 20 said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Paul had found a new life at the cross. He had come there and he had died as Jesus died. But secondly, we can meet Jesus at the tomb. The ladies were the first ones that went to the, to the tomb to see Jesus, to anoint his body. But when they got there, the stone was already removed. Jesus was no longer dead. His resurrection gives us hope of life. His resurrection is a place where we can find a new life in Christ Jesus. Again, we go to the book of Colossians, and this time we look at chapter 2. And in chapter 2, Paul has this to say, beginning in verse 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Circumcision was an old part of the Mosaic law, and it involved the removing of the flesh. But now, God has provided us a spiritual circumcision and he describes it in verse 12 when he says we are buried with him in baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. While we were dead in sin, we went to the cross and met with Jesus and there found the blood able to cleanse our sins. In the tomb, we find the death of sin. Paul speaks of this as the body of sin which dies. It is buried just as Jesus was buried in that borrowed tomb. But the resurrection is the new life that God gives to us as we undergo the transition of baptism. Buried with him in baptism. Buried in a fashion as Jesus was buried in the earth. So we're buried in water. To be raised to walk in a newness of life. So that we can meet Jesus in a watery grave. Jesus has promised that his tomb is for us. And we can meet with him to obtain the remission of our sins. But Jesus also spoke to his apostles of another meeting place. And it's one we enjoy every first day of the week. In Luke, the 22nd chapter, beginning at verse 29, notice that Jesus said, I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Jesus promised that there would be a table in his kingdom. When he instituted the Lord's Supper, he spoke to his apostles and said, I will not eat of this 
again until I eat it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The kingdom is the body of obedient believers. The kingdom is made up of the saved. And all the saved assemble together and partake of the Lord's Supper. This was done on the first day of the week. Because it was on the first day of the week that the women discovered the tomb to be empty. It was a day of the resurrection. It was a day of joy and hope. And Jesus promised that he would be with us when we partook of this Lord's Supper. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 chapter would speak to the Corinthian church about this particular memorial feast and he said, do this in remembrance of me, quoting the Lord. Jesus left behind a table, a table with items that represent his body, the unleavened bread, and his blood, the fruit of the vine. These two things recall to our memory his death for us. But Jesus has promised to be with us. How important it is, therefore, for us to remember him in this way. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, and verse 20, Paul would write, when we come together, it is to partake of the Lord's Supper. There is a reason why we assemble together. It is to worship our God and to give thanks to Christ who died for us. And a part of that memory is an observance of the Lord's Supper. Someone has well said that this is the one thing that Jesus instituted in memory of his death, the Lord's Supper. You can read through the New Testament and it's the only thing Jesus ever required of his followers to observe the Lord's Supper. So this should be important to us. This should be a time when we can meet around the table with our Lord who has promised to be with us and eat with us and drink with us in memory of him. But another appointment we have with Jesus is the appointment of prayer. Prayer is a powerful thing and it was so in the life of Jesus. Jesus prayed before all of the major decisions he made in his life. He prayed before he chose his apostles. He prayed before he was arrested in the garden. He prayed even from the cross. So prayer had an important role in the life of Jesus. So much so that his disciples on one occasion asked him, teach us, Lord, to pray. They recognized how important it was to Jesus. But in John chapter 14, Jesus taught them that prayer was a way of reaching him. Prayer is not just us talking to God. It's us talking to God through the Son. Notice what he said in John the 14th chapter and verse 13. To his disciples, Jesus said, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye ask anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus told his followers to use his name. A lot of prayers are offered in our world today for various reasons on various occasions. But I'm very disappointed sometimes to hear prayers that are offered and no name of Jesus is ever mentioned. You know the only reason we get to pray? Jesus. The only way we have to reach the Father is Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me. So when we pray, Jesus is with us. And Jesus is helping us to receive the attention of the Father. Jesus has promised that our prayers will matter. We know that not every prayer we pray gets answered. Sometimes we ask amiss. Sometimes our prayers are not driven by faith, as they should be. But our prayers, when offered properly in His name, Jesus' promises will be heard. What a powerful thing that is. 
We don't always get the answers to our prayers that we desire. But we can rest assured that because of Jesus Christ, we can get our prayers to God. He's promised to do that for us. And so prayer is a wonderful place to meet with Jesus. Sometimes we sing that song, we come to the garden alone to pray, to talk to the Lord, to get the Lord on our side, to use His name and His authority to reach the Heavenly Father. And that's something that sometimes we neglect in our lives. But it's a powerful thing. But all these things are appointments that Jesus has made with us. Those apostles went out of their way and made every preparation to get to Galilee. Jesus had said, I'm going to be there. This morning, how much preparation do we make to get to be with the Lord? Do we make the preparation to march to the cross and give our sins up? Do we make the preparation to go to the tomb and bury that old man of sin and let him come to life again in the Spirit of God? Do we march to the table on the first day of the week to remember the Lord as He sits and eats and drinks with us in His presence? And do we utilize prayer as we all? An opportunity to talk to God through the Lord and in His name. But you know, all this comes down to an important appointed time when we will again see Jesus Christ. I'm sure the apostles who had the experience of having lived with him longed to see him again. We on the other hand have not physically seen Jesus and therefore we long to see him initially for the first time. He's with us spiritually. He's with us in help and comfort. He's with us in teaching. But the time is coming when we will appear before him. I turn now to the book of 2 Corinthians in chapter 5. I'd like for us to notice how this life one day will come to an end. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 beginning at verse 6 the apostle Paul writes therefore we always are confident knowing that while we are at home in the body we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. The apostles were fully convinced that the promises of Jesus were real and that one day He was going to come back and receive us unto Himself. They lived with that faith and that confidence fully assured that we will all see him one day. But notice as he continues his words. He says in verse 8, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You know, when death comes and takes us with a cold hand and leads us to another world, somebody will be waiting there for us. Somebody will be present. We will not be alone. We will be present with the Lord. Paul then says, Wherefore we labor, that whether we're with Him or not with Him, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. Jesus, who has been our friend and our Savior, and has given himself at Calvary, and his blood has been shed to forgive us of our sins, and he was buried and he was resurrected to give us the hope of eternal life. But one day when this life ends, Jesus will be our judge. We will stand in His presence and we will give an account. We will answer His inquiries. We will respond to what He has done for us. And 
we will give an account for the deeds that we have done here, whether good or bad. That will be an appointment we'll keep. All men will stand before him. I don't know about you, but if I know I'm going to have to stand before someone in judgment, I want to get to know them a little bit now. I want them to become my friend now. I want them to like me now. I want to be with them now. Jesus has made appointments for us to meet him here. We can get to know Him here. Because nobody wants to stand in judgment in front of a judge that they have never known and who they've never even liked. If you're here this morning, Jesus has made appointments and He kept every one He promised. He met with those apostles in Galilee just as He said He would. He's promised us that He's coming again in John the 14th chapter. And He will. He has promised us that we will stand before Him in judgment. And we will. But meanwhile, He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Turn from sin at the cross. Enter into the death of Jesus and be raised to walk in a new life of baptism. Pray. Live for Him. Give Him all thou hast to give. And one day, we will be rewarded beyond our wildest dreams by He who made all things. That's our Jesus. As we stand together and as we sing.